We are recording the meeting and we're meeting virtually pursuant to authority granted us by uh, the legislature and the governor. It's really wonderful to see you all again. Uh, thank you all for uh, your patience as we've worked ourselves back to the point where we can resume the work that we need to do on the building project. Um, I'm going to ask you each to just um, let us know that you're here by signifying it vocally. Sharon? Here. Thank you. Christine? Here. Nice to see you, Christine. Sean? Here. Alex? Here. And Austin is here. So we have a quorum. We are joined by colleagues from FAA and Colliers, our OPM. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us. And we are assisted, okay. as always, by the great um, Angela, Angela Mills. So let's start with the approval of the minutes. Uh, of uh, October 6th. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Christine. Uh, are there corrections to the minutes? Okay, are we ready to vote on the minutes? If you would signify your approval by saying yes or your disapproval by saying no, Sharon? Yes. Thank you, Christine. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, Sean? I'm going to abstain. I don't think I was at that meeting. Um, Alex? Yes. And Austin says yes. OK, so the minutes are approved. Uh, the next item is the town manager's report. But the town manager is not present. So I think what we should do for the moment is to skip over the town manager's report. And when Paul arrives, we'll we'll do that. It's okay. Do I have everybody's consent to do that? Okay. So Sean, next is the financial update, a review and approval of invoices. What do you mm -hmm. have for us? So Craig, I have two invoices. Is that what's on your radar too? It's, I know it's been a while since we have met. So I have a uh, September invoice and an October invoice. Both from Colliers or? Both from Colliers, um, yeah. I don't have anything from FAA. So, so, I, so I'll bring those up. I, I think that's correct, Sean. The, the last yeah. one from FAA, I think, was from maybe August. Yeah. September. Yep. So is it okay if I share my screen, Austin, and just bring those up quickly? Please, please do. Uh, Angela, is it possible to make me co-host or enable sharing? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, Sharon, has to Sharon, do that. Sharon, you have to make him co-host. You can okay. take it away from me because I'm not here for the whole meeting. OK, can you walk me through that? Uh, click on the dots next to my name. Yeah, so hover over his yeah. name and you can make him co-host. Did that work? Thanks. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this first invoice is the September invoice. Um, again, we have an established uh, contract with Colliers for the different phases. Um, so we get the same monthly billing each month. So the first one, again, is for, uh, for September for $10,978. Uh, the next invoice is for October um, for the same amount. Um, and yeah, anything you want to add, Craig? I, I know you've been supporting um, uh, sort of the work. There's been various requests for information and, and working mm -hmm. on some contracts with some of the consultants for the designers over the past couple of months is sort of the, some of the key things that I've been aware of. But anything else you want to add in terms of um, what you've been working on the last couple of months? Um, we, we put it all in that, in that description of services up top. So each month, uh, we update that. We don't use that as, um, a sort of a template. We actually, so the, for the top five items. Right. So for the month of October, that's what we worked on primarily. Uh, and then the September version has a, a similar thing, but, um, customized to that, to that month's work. And you're exactly right. It's mostly, you know, support work, um, contracts, um, reporting. 
coordinating. So, so I, th oh, go ahead, do, you make a, do you want me to make a motion, Austin? Yeah, to I was going to ask these? you. Yep. Yeah, so I move to approve the September and October invoices for Colliers. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay, we're, we're, we're voting to approve payment of these indoor, uh, in, to recommend payment of these invoices, Sharon? Yes. Christine? Yes. Uh, Alex? Yes. Sean? Yes. Paul Bockelman? Yes. And Austin Sarad votes yes. And thank you for that. Sean, anything else under financial update? Yeah, I'll look again for Craig to maybe help with this, um, but we're working on a couple different um, sort of subcontracts, right, to the to the design contracts. I know there's work being done on selecting a consultant to help with the furniture, uh, the furniture for the new building. Um, and then the other one we're working on, um, I'm blanking on it, Craig, maybe you can remind Commissioning agent. Commissioning agent, yeah. So, uh, so the hiring the consultant who will um, evaluate all the systems and all the all the promises we make in terms of the efficiency of the building and the the outputs of the building um, to make sure that the final product actually delivers everything that we're promising. Um, so, in our conversations with Craig, it's it's sort of standard to bring those people in at the design phase so that they can help fully understand what's being put in, maybe advise on some things. Um, and then that puts them in a much better place to evaluate them at the end when the building opens up. That's exa think, exactly right, that, Sean. Okay. And, and if I may, I'll, I'll add in um, the furniture and equipment um, consultant. That's a contract that will be through the design team, FAA. The uh, commissioning agent will be a contract that will be direct with the town. And so we've asked um, Colliers to assist in developing sort of the scope of what the commissioning agent uh, will do and a request for proposals and to solicit some proposals. Um, and Colliers mentioned that they have a sort of separate wing of their uh, company that provides commissioning services. So we'll get a proposal from Colliers as well as a couple other um, commissioning agents uh, for us to consider. Um, I don't know. I think just for the sake of all of us and obviously anybody who is attending, uh, Craig, could you just say just a couple more sentences about a commissioning agent? Um, what is it is that they do, uh, why it is that we need one, uh, and whether, uh, as I assume it is, it is kind of standard practice to have a commissioning agent. Yes, uh, very good questions um, or um, aspects to want more information about. So a commissioning agent, uh, they're essentially engineers who work directly for the client, and their primary job is to verify that uh, the eventual building you get is functioning according to the design. So that's their sort of primary role. And um, it's they're actually now a part of the requirement from the building code, so you need a commissioning agent uh, to confirm that your building is um, uh, energy efficient to, to meet the um, energy code requirements. Um, the other thing that they do, and so that's pretty standard. Um, the other thing that they do, as Sean was mentioning, is we can have them um, start during design and they can uh, help with, with several aspects. One is um, as a client, you guys um, will be producing an owner's project requirements report. And what that is, is a statement about how the building should be functioning from a sustainability standpoint, from, you know, energy use, from a comfort level of comfort, um, all, all things having to do with how you want your building to perform. That document will be given to the design team, the design team and their engineers um, will respond to that um, with a basis of design document, which basically parrots back, all right, this is what you've asked us to do. This is what um, we are. This is how we're designing the building to to um, respond to that. Um, some clients have in-house expertise that are able to do that on their own. Usually, like hospitals, um, uh, clients who do a lot of work and are very familiar with the uh, building process. But most do not have in-house expertise at that level, and so hire a consult, um, commissioning agent to help them with that. 
the other thing that the commissioning agent can do is as uh, the design team is putting together their drawing set and developing it at the milestone points, um, colliers as OPMs take a look at uh, those document sets and try to and, and, you know, comment on them about constructability, um, uh, making sure that all the, the systems that are needed are represented and just a high level review of the documents in order to help the design team make them as tight as possible come bid day. Um, the commissioning agent uh, performs a similar role, uh, but again, with a mind towards the function, the mechanical systems, the sustainability, the right. energy use. And right. so those are the two primary things uh, okay. that they, they'll do for you. Right, and so we'll be looking forward to seeing um, the f e &E and this commissioning agent uh, uh, a little further down the road. Yeah, correct, correct. Well, the commissioning right. agent, once we once we yep. get you guys some proposals, you will help you evaluate those proposals yep. and you'll pick one and they'll start working um, as, as soon as possible okay. uh, in design development. Great. Um, the, the furniture and equipment um, consultants, similar, uh, uh, once the design team has them on board, I think there'll be a you know, kickoff meeting um, to, to get things going, but then both entities will be working with you through the end of the project. And when do you anticipate, if all goes well, that we might be in a position to select the commissioning agent? Um, I would say, so we're at the very beginning of December, I would say in early January is when we can anticipate okay. um, making a selection. Great. Uh, I see Christine. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, is that already built into the budget, the commissioning? Yes. And how do they charge? Is it like when it bids, is it like a lump sum or it's just they just like a consultant charge? It's a consultant. So uh, we do have a line item for commissioning in the uh, budget. Uh, it is, you know, looking at it now, uh, it is a little bit light. We have eighty thousand uh, dollars earmarked for that. Um, we're at, anticipating it's going to be a little more than that. Um, so possibly twice as much as that. So um, that would be that delta between those two values uh, will come out of um, owner contingency, or could come out of owner contingency. So to make up the difference, we'll also, you know, streamline the the services. Uh, give you just what you need, so you're not, you know, okay. um, getting say the the Cadillac of commissioning, but a nice dependable, you know, Toyota, um, or Ford, or whatever whatever that that analogy uses. Um, <laughs> and then yeah, there you go. And then your question about how they bill, so they are, um, so they'll have in their proposal it'll be broken down by phase. And so in design development, they'll have a lump sum that they. Um, that they're billing and then same thing for each of the phases construction administration or construction phase will be the the, the uh, largest percentage uh, i believe it's 20 or 25 percent of their fees typically pre-construction and then the remaining 75 to 80 percent is during construction great but we'll see all this when we have proposals absolutely alex thanks um so i i guess i just kind of um building off that it, it sounded like when you were explaining the role of the commissioning agent, that there were different levels that we could contract them for. Um, and I don't know if your reference to the Cadillac was that reference. I mean, so will it be sort of an a la carte menu so that we can decide, you know, does it make sense for that sort of mechanical sustainability piece? Um, so I guess I, guess I want to, I don't yep. know how the RFP is going to yep. be put together, but I guess I want to make right. sure that we are asking for all of the options and then we can choose yep. what makes sense at the time. So there's there's primarily two um, big pieces to their work. Uh, one is the mechanical and electrical plumbing systems, and the other is the envelope of the building. Um, and envelope commissioning is not required. Um, the during you know uh, during construction mechanical systems commissioning is required you know by code. So that's sort of the decision point. So you can benefit from having an envelope commissioning agent. Uh, but it is not required. And so if we can't make the dollars and cents work, then that is a service that is very valuable, very useful, um, but is not one that is required. So that's sort of the one, one sort of decision point. Craig, can I just Alex, ask a quick, or can I ask a quick follow-up? Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, Alex, did that answer your question? 
Yes and no, I guess. So again, and maybe I didn't understand correctly, but it sounded like you could have them involved from the design development phase, but that wasn't necessary, right? So you can contract them at the end and they say, okay, this is what, you know, this is what you said your building's going to do and this is what it's doing and that's what's required by the code. But yep. what I heard you say was we could involve them in the design development process to help us script out what our expectations are of the architects and then work with us. And so I guess that's the piece I'm asking. And I'm assuming, and maybe that's what you mean by envelope is that piece. No, I'm sorry. Um, I'll, I'll, clar I'll try to clarify. I wish I had a graphic, but I didn't prepare one. Um, so we've got two time periods before construction, design phase, and then construction. Um, of those, and then we also have two kind of scopes of work. One is mechanical systems, and one is the exterior of the building. We call it the envelope. It's the walls, it's the roof, the insulation, the windows. Um, of those two time periods, the only one that's required by code is to have a commissioning agent during construction. So even though it's highly recommended, it is not required to have a commissioning agent for the mechanical systems during design phase. For the building envelope, neither is required either, neither um, during design nor during construction. And so in reality, you could break it out down into kind of like four scopes of work and only one of the four is required. Right, so I guess my question is either to town who's creating the RFP or Collier, whoever's creating the RFP is, yep. will we be asking for all four of those phases as a, as a pricing so that we can select rather than Yes, absolutely. So, right. So like one combination is you might say, all right, well, we want the mechanical electrical commissioning during design and during construction. That's sort of like one option. Or you can say we want envelope commissioning and MEP commissioning for both of those um, or just MEP for during construction. Yeah. So there will, there will be multiple. We'll have them break down uh, line items and then you can pick we want A and B and, and that's it or A, B, C and D. Right. Oh, Sean, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it's okay. Um, and Craig, just to follow through the process, if they um, say they do the commissioning, something's not measuring up to what we thought it would, is that then a basis to get the contractor to go back and, and fix or address it until it does meet what was yes. expected? Okay. Yes, that's exactly right. So they, they are another agent working on behalf of the town, ensuring that the contractor uh, fulfills their contractual obligations. Right. So yeah, so if a uh, mechanical system is not, uh, let's say the the, the temperature controls aren't working properly. You've got an ex, another expert on your side saying, contractor, here is how it's supposed to function. It's not functioning that way. We know because we tested it and we've got a report. And, uh, the, you know, and so now you've got to fix it. So then they fix it and then they retest it. So yeah, it's another way to ensure the uh, quality of the end product. Okay, thank you, Craig. Thanks for the preview about the uh both of those things and the ff and e sean are you all set now yes yep that's it okay so with consent i think we can now go back to the town manager's report town manager it's nice to see you so there are two items that are listed under the town manager's report and anything of course else that you want to report a uh, project status the moa addendum and the additional state funding initiative so um the moa addendum that's done right so we're complete with that um i'm sorry what were the other two the next item listed says additional state funding initiative update so the um there are people working to with the um state to move that forward. I wasn't at the last update, so that's, I don't have an update on that, but I think there's still efforts along those lines. Sharon may have more information than I do. Sharon? She's your hand up even. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, so the the, uh, the process is moving forward, although it's kind of slowed down because um, of the holidays and new folks will be uh, sworn in in January, new folks across the state, but I have seen, um, some wording uh, language that uh, Representative Dom is working on with other uh, representatives from across the state. So um, full steam ahead. I, I'm optimistic. Paul, anything else from you? 
No, I don't think so, Austin. Thank Great. You. And again, to say publicly, I think what we've said before, thank you to you and to Sean and to people on the town council for the work that was done in getting us through the process of uh, um, amending the memorandum of yeah. uh, agreement. Thank, thank, and thank you. And the trustees and Sharon as well. Thanks to all. Okay. Craig, Collier's project leaders, it's to you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Sharon, would, oh, I see you've uh, given me the ability. Oh, I can't share. Would you give me the permission to share, please? All right, fantastic. Thank you. All right, so first, I'd like to run us through the schedule real quick um, because we are now back in business. Uh, things, the project is moving forward again. Um, this ha the schedule has settled down, and so I'll walk you through it real quick. As we, as has been the case all along, uh, the dates are along the top. Our activities are on the left hand side. Each bar. Uh, representing uh, or each square representing a month. So here we are today at this red line. We are in still in the design phase. Uh, we are currently at the beginning of December. We're in um, those plan, um, the, the layout update um, portion of the design. So uh, as a result in schematic design at the very end, there were some changes um, that were requested both from the town and the MDLC or from the library and the MDLC. Uh, the, the design team is now executing those. They're making those changes and working back and forth um, with the library and with the MDLC to come up with uh, layouts, modified layouts that meet everybody's needs. That effort will continue through December to the very beginning of January. Um, at that point, those drawing those layouts will be uh, will be looking for approval of those layouts from the MBLC so that we can move into the, uh, the the real design development. Let's say the the typical design development activities. The design development is a four month effort design effort, uh, and then we've got a month at the end that we've identified for uh, cost estimating, reconciliation, value management, or value engineering if it's needed approvals by all the um, stakeholders. Then we'll move into construction documents, which is a, um, I think we've got five and a half month duration. Again, design phase. That brings us to November 17th. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, and then as we move forward, construction beginning uh, mid-February, 2024, and extending all the way to the end of August, 2025. And that's when the library we would move in. And uh, the library is uh, anticipated to be open, say the beginning, uh, middle or end of November, 2025. So uh, basically two years from now. So what I wanted to uh, emphasize or, or um, advise you all on is that uh, the MBLC in the contract with the MBLC, they have two primary deadlines. Uh, the first primary deadline is the completion of the construction document package. That's this bar here. It marks the end of the design phase. And the second um, is hiring the contractor. They called it uh, breaking ground, um, but essentially by their definition, it's when you hire the contractor. So the first deadline was originally um, in May. It was May 21st of 2023. Um, as a result of some of the schedule slippage that we've seen, um, we weren't gonna make that date. It was not possible for the design team to accelerate their work. Um, and so we asked the MBLC for an extension and they granted it. So they moved that to November 17th um, to complete the construction documents. Um, and in our schedule, in all of these bars, what we've included is time to design the work, price the work, and get approvals. Um, in the industry, when, we're, when you're talking about um, activities, uh, we use the term float when there's extra time to either complete a task or multiple tasks without affecting the end date. Um, so, oh, we've got a week of float or a month of float. Um, 
in order to meet these deadlines, we basically don't have any more, or in order to meet this first deadline, we don't have any more float. There's no extra time. To meet the, um, the start of construction deadline, there is some float. So you'll see, you know, construction, you'd have your contractor here in mid-February. Uh, that deadline, contractual deadline is not till the end of June. So there's, you know, several months of float. Um, here we, uh, for the design phase, we're basically up against the wall. So to uh, hit these deadlines, um, one thing that we're proposing is a, a streamlined decision-making process. Um, so the design team gets what they need when they need it. Um, so to help us with that, we've asked the design team to identify what we were calling decision points, which is a decision from uh, the, the LBC um, and the time frame or a, a window when that decision needs to be made. Um, so they'll, there's a, a series of them. And um, later in the meeting, we'll have the design team sort of run through. They've, they've done a nice graphic and laid out the design development portion of the, of, of the design effort. Um, and in order to make those decisions, of course, you guys need some information. And so we've asked the design team for each decision to one, give advance notice, which will be represented in this um, schedule that they've, that they've worked up. Two, provide you guys with materials and information to review say, you know, the week before we can send something off or in, in the cases where the design subcommittee is looking at something, they'll look at it first and then the LBC will um, uh, authorize it sort of same week, beginning of the week, end of week. Uh, and then three, uh, you know, provide deadlines, interim deadlines of when they need that information, which is also represented in that um, schedule or work plan, if you will. Craig, November 17th is a real deadline that is a real deadline. So the MBLC has, um, as I said, they, we, we requested an extension. They granted the extension. Uh, in their email, which they granted the extension, their language was pretty clear that um, they do not have any appetite for more extensions. So, so I think do not have any appetite means this deadline is real. And if we were to fail to meet it, it would create jeopardy for the project. That is a correct statement, yes. And that means, as we're going to see in a little while, that we, the building committee, need to think about our work in a slightly different way than we did, because we now have to make sure, in addition that we're making all the correct design decisions, that we're doing it in a timely way. And the way in which our process was originally organized was not organized with the notion of there's a drop dead deadline there was lots of float. Is that the phrase? You've got it. Original schedule. So we've got to maybe, maybe rethink a little bit about the schedule of our work and how we do it and how we work with subcommittees or whether we work with subcommittees, because we have to make this deadline. Is that right? That is right. Okay. So do you want to say anything else about this chart? Um, no, I think that's unless there are questions well, about just it. Ask, are there any questions about this chart, the schedule? Okay, Craig. Thank you. Thank you. And so we're, we'll we'll jump uh, jump around a little bit, or we'll follow the um, the agenda. The next thing okay. is the budget, so I'll I'll talk about that. But then we right. will be doubling back with the design team tonight on sort of those decision uh, right decision points. So moving on to budget. So I know this is teeny tiny, but you know here's our budget, um, the project budget from September 12th. This has not changed, um, but I flash it up here on the screen because I it that's that because it um ties into uh your financial status report which we haven't looked at in a number of oh I see Sean's got his hand raised. Sean? Yeah this is just was a quick thing on the timeline um and maybe it was on there and I didn't see it. We should start thinking about folding in um when council meetings may need to be scheduled um, near the end of that process. Again, given the short notice, we should start trying to factor that in now um, to make sure everything's lined up and there's plenty of time um, for that piece to happen. I, I don't know if there's any council meetings that have to happen in order for the construction documents to be completed. So that's not a, um, I don't think that's a, a big issue, but I think it would help just to have that folded in as well. I think that's a, a, a great idea. Um, and we can certainly add a line uh, or a graphic to this. Um, the 
town council that is that a twice a year meeting? No, they meet they meet every week it seems like um oh, but there's okay. at least at least once <laughs> so, a month so i think to follow up on sean's suggestion you should consult with sharon and sharon will help you uh, let's not discuss the micro schedule of the town council sharon will help you figure out what it is that uh, we can do to make sure that it's clear on the schedule that certain decisions are going to have to be made by the town council fantastic will do all right so uh back to the financial status report so uh this was updated i think last night um not a whole lot of activity um but i will show you that oops this is page three i'm sorry page one uh so the as the invoices come in we track all of them uh thus far the only invoices the uh, project has received is is the design team and so um right here in column d1 this is what the design team in thousands has invoiced and, and had been approved to date. Um, down here, uh, project manager here are, are our invoices. And then the only other invoices um, the town has seen it has been the owner's cost estimator, um, that first, um, that schematic design cost estimate. So there's their amount there. Um, that's all that's changed since the last time we've looked at this, probably three months ago. Uh, but I think. Uh, what Sean and I have talked about in the past is that once a month we'll pull this up and uh, so we can so that the committee is is um, fully informed of how the the money is being spent. Good. So uh, are there any questions about that? Okay. All right. Next thing on the agenda, the MBLC process um, for that. I, I wanted to take a, a moment, sort of fill everyone in on uh, their review process. So the MBLC um, uh, has to approve the, the project at key points in order for us to move forward. Uh, one of them is they have to approve the schematic design in order for us to move into design development. Uh, same thing happens at design development. Uh, they'll, we'll be looking for their approval uh, and that would be somewhere around the end of April 2023 to move into construction documents. And then the construction documents, that full package, they have to approve it before uh, we put it out to bid. So those are three like approval points. Um, but um, they also have a series of uh, reviews. So at each of the upcoming phases at the 50% mark, at the 75% mark, and at the 95 to 99% mark, they review with us. Um, and so the design team had, for this schematic design layout, the design team has been working back and forth, as I mentioned earlier, um, to get that approval so that we can move into design development uh, at the beginning of 2023. Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay. Hearing, hearing none. Let's see what else we have on the agenda. Okay. Gender inclusive restrooms is next on the agenda. Yes, and for that, I'd like to turn things over to the design team. Um, we we have uh, you know, Josephine, Tony, and then I saw Andrew, yes, and then Andrew is there as well. Um, which of you would like to, do you have um, something you'd like to put up on the screen to uh, refresh everyone's memories about the uh, gender inclusive bathrooms? Hi everyone, yes, um, we do have a slide um, showing some um new options um and we'll just like briefly touch upon the items that we talked about last time um and am i able to share my screen at this time and then uh i just wanted to point out or, or underscore the goal tonight the, the reason why we're showing this again is the goal is uh this is this is important information the design team needs to move their layouts forward and so they're looking for a, a, a final direction from this committee about which style of gender inclusive toilet is the preference and they want yeah. that tonight yes thank you yep so um we'll show you now what we're sort of working through as we make the plan changes um that we're in the, in the current phase that we're in right now and um we originally produced um, a light medium and heavy option for you for you folks to sort of 
digest and, and decide on, but we're going to show you now sort of a more flexible option. And, um, and I think um, if you folks um, agree, we can just continue moving forward with this one. Uh, let me try to share my screen here. Okay. Is everyone able to see my screen? Yep. Okay, so um, you can see the proposed plan on the left. Um, this sort of uh, foregoes the light, medium, heavy options we were looking at previously. What this does is it creates um, two restrooms and um, each of them containing um, only toilet stalls. And um, the biggest difference is here is that we call this the flexible option because um, we have one adjoining wall here that's separating the two. But you have sort of two options that you can work with with this. Um, one is you can sort of start off with two restrooms if that's the, the way you folks want to move forward into DD. Um, you can also have the option to have an opening at the two ends of the wall. And that would allow you to have one gender inclusive restroom. Um, the, the thought is that this would be um, sort of an efficient layout. It doesn't take up any more square footage than we had previously. And, um, and it's um, in our minds very flexible because if you choose to maybe create one restroom down um, down the road in the future. Um, this allows you that flexibility by, um, if you can see here, the red dashed lines on each side, if you picture those as sort of openings in the wall, um, it's it's easy enough to change that. So if you start off with one restroom and, and security reasons or other things are, are sort of um, not working for you, then you can potentially close those walls off and, and, and change the, lay, the layout. Um, uh, same in the other direction. If you choose to have one restroom, um, or sorry, two restrooms, and then um, open it down the road um, to, into a, one communal arm, then you can do that too, and um, without too much um, work. So, uh, since this is a fairly efficient layout, we thought we could probably proceed in this direction, but wanted um, <laughs> feedback and what your thoughts are. We we. Um, I can dive right into the, the standard semi-private and maximum privacy stalls, but does anyone have any questions yet on the, or at, at the moment on the plan layout itself? Any questions about the proposed plan diagram? Uh, Alex? Yeah, I just have one question. Um, Justine, I assume this is just sort of a simplified drawing. I mean, Alex, it's very hard to hear. Can you hear me? Try again. Can you hear me now? It's uh, still a little muffled. Right now. Try again. Sorry, we're co-meeting right now, so my um um. Uh, how about now? Can you hear me? Yep. Better. Okay. Um, on the drawing, I assume this is a simplified drawing. I'm I'm just thinking about you know changing stations like a like a. Do you have changing stations on both sides or like a family changing station? So I guess I'm just trying to figure out how we're navigating sort of that piece of it. Um, yeah. So, so, uh -huh. so if you're um, depend, it's going to be um, depending on which direction we go in. Yes, we could have them in both stalls. I didn't understand your response to Alex. So where would change stations be in this proposed plan? So a baby changing station could be in both stalls in this plan. It so that that's the thing. If we have two restaurants, if this is split up into two restrooms, we would we could provide um, one in each stall. So it when you're referencing stalls, I, I, I'm thinking of stalls in, where you go to the toilet. That's not what you're talking about, right? One in each restroom. Sorry about there that. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Alex, did that answer your question? Yeah, I think I just wanted to make sure that we didn't run into any uh, 
code issues and, and wind up sort of shrinking the available facilities. Um, just that it allowed us truly maximum flexibility. I was trying to Great. That. Yeah. Yes, Thank you, um, Alex. The only, just to reference the code, um, the only thing that um, having, if this turned into um, one restroom and the two um, openings remained at the top and the bottom of the screen here, um, we would have to go for variance. Um, and um, that's just one item that we would have to obtain if we went in this direction as one gender inclusive restroom. Great, thank you. Christine. Um, yeah, so I, I haven't seen a design um, diagram in a long time. So I assume this is the first floor, the bottom floor we're talking about. Um, yeah. And I was wondering if there'll be any other like family or single bathrooms adjacent or near this. Just this is. So we don't currently have an individual stall adjacent to it. Um, this is something that we could look at. Um, we actually have talked internally about adding um, a single restroom, um, whether for staff or family, depending on um, you know what you folks are looking for. We potentially could add that adjacent to or in a different location <clears throat> on the ground level. But this restroom um, is at still at the ground level. This you know uh, single gender inclusive restroom um, would be at the ground level, and then on levels um, one and two up above, we still have the single um, uh, restrooms, the unisex restrooms. Um, those haven't changed. Great. Christine? So just to clarify, so this would be the only bathroom and bathroom layout um, on the bottom floor. And this is exact with the eight um, toilets. That's enough for code for the load. I assume we still have the meeting, the big room, auditorium, whatever, down on the basement. That's, we'll, we'll be confirming all of that in DD. Okay. Thank you. Christine, are you all set? Yes. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Okay, so um, no other comments or questions about the proposed plan. Okay, Josephine, you want to go to the next part, the standard, the semi, and the maximum? Sure. Um, so we've laid out right next to the plan here, we've laid out the three options that um, you can move forward with for the individual stalls themselves. Um, we did uh, run through these with you um, the last time we met, I think, um, but we wanted to just run through them again because you can go with any of these options for either layout that you go with um, for the restroom. And so the first um, most standard one is, is this first one here, standard privacy. This is the toilet stall um, that you see in most restrooms, um, in most public restrooms. And um, generally, yes, they are the least expensive. Um, and, uh, you know, they're typically, um, you know, secured top and bottom. Um, to floor and ceiling, and um, they're, you know, pretty basic, right? So that is your typical stall. Um, we can move into the next one, which is the semi-private. Um, this one you might see sometimes. Um, it's not quite as common, um, a little bit more expensive, um, and it offers up a little bit more privacy. So, um, it sort of balances out a bit of the security um, and privacy that concerns that most folks have. Um, and we did just, you know, give you some dimensions here at the top and bottom. So you have a sense of what um, you might be looking at for, um, you know, for that privacy and, uh, and security um, concern. And then here at the right, um, that's more of a fully enclosed stall. And so this can go different directions, but um, there are some that are just, um, you know, fully enclosed walls like drywall um, that are closing off the whole space. And, and then there are some manufacturers that provide something that's um, quite closed off, such as this one here. And um, this is the most expensive, of course. And this is when we start getting into uh, potentially having um, 
separate uh, lighting, drainage, ventilation, um, sprinkler requirements, all things we'd have to look into in DD um, if you want to go that route. But, um, but this is going to, of course, offer you the most privacy um, and thereby maybe some security concerns. But, um, but these are the three options really that, right. that we're looking at. Josephine, when you say least to most, could you just give us a very off the top ballpark of what the difference is roughly least to most? Um, so the 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 semi-private, I'm not sure what the cost is. We know we've heard that the individual stalls can run between ten to twelve thousand each for each stall because of the additional um, MEPs that are required for the individual stalls. Um, so that's the only one that we can confirm. We know um, that we have that number. I, I can't generally say what, um, maybe Craig actually could speak to if he has a number off the top of his head, um, what it, the you know, standard toilet stall is at the moment. I, I do not, but that's something we could probably pull out of uh, the cost estimate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm asking this question because if you want the board, or the board, if you want the committee to weigh in tonight about which, what, where, where we want you to go, or do you want us just to weigh in about the proposed plan, or you want us to weigh in about which of the three alternatives? So the proposed plan would be great because then we have something to work with to lay out the floor plans, and that's really the most important thing. Um, as far as moving forward with the um, stall configurations, somewhere in DD. Um, okay. We'll so be we're, asking that question for you. The decision that you want tonight is going to focus on the what you call the proposed plan, not the standard semi-private maximum. Correct. Yes. Okay. So, Christine, before I call on you, Paul, I have a question for you, which is, is there a town-wide kind of standard for gender-inclusive uh, uh, restrooms in terms of uh, whether or not you, you like the, this kind of, op you know, both of them open or... Is there anything that the town has thought about that might affect our conversation? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, Thank, thanks so much. So Christine, I think you were next. Um, yeah, I just, so about the least moderate or most, just looking at them, I can see why the most is the most. Josephine was very clear about how it adds on all this other functionality and, and um, building requirements which is pricey. But when I look at standard and semi, to me, it should be least expensive and maybe just a little bit more expensive because maybe I'm missing it, but I only see a slightly larger door. Is there any other expense to really the difference of the two besides the size of the door or the slightly higher wall or lower walls? Um, more materials because the side walls are also um, lower as well. And are these becoming the semi-private a little, like I could see why they might've been more expensive when they were rare, they weren't standard, meaning coming out of the factories, but with this whole gender inclusive stuff, I was wondering if there is more demand starting to happen on the semi-privates, which might help drive down cost. That's a good question. Um, and potentially it, it could be there. Um, we, we could actually reach out you know, as Craig mentioned, you know, to our estimators and, and actually see what, what they have for numbers, you know, for um, some of the different stalls or even reach out to certain vendors as well and get some numbers. Hey, Josephine, I want to just make sure that we're, that we're procedurally doing what we need to do tonight. What we need to do tonight is to give you feedback on the proposed plan diagram. Is that correct? That's correct. And is the standard semi-private or maximum, are they all compatible with any decision that we make on the proposed plan? Yes. So I think right now our attention should be focused on the proposed plan. Is that right? Yes. Okay, Paul? So I support the proposed plan. I think it's flexible. It gives us some options down the road without limiting us. So I support the proposed plan. I also support, and I'm going on this, Austin, uh, standard privacy because I think that's the, that's the one I prefer whether it was more expensive or not um, for lots of different reasons I can get into but that's where I land this proposed plan yes standard privacy preference let's do let's talk about the proposed plan and see whether we can reach a 
uh, an agreement about that uh, before we get down into the weeds about semi-private or the rest. Is that okay, Christine? Um, well, the reason why I was just trying to um, flesh out a little bit the difference of the three, and maybe I'll, so I'll ask Josephine, if you went with the maximum privacy, does that require more space in that layout that you have because you have to have all the more HVAC systems or drainage, or can you still fit it in that tight little space? And does it still feel good? Yeah, you know, we'll have to look at a little bit more in DD, but um, we're pretty confident about the numbers we have here. If it were to grow, it would be minimal. I don't think um, it would it would um, affect the plan in in a bad way at all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions about the proposed plan? And Josephine, the the key to the proposed plan that you're asking us to consider now. Do you uh, are we considering whether the, the walls are open or closed? Is that what you're offering us? Or are you saying it doesn't matter at this point whether we like the walls open or closed? I think we're okay right now. Um, and that can be a DD item again okay, because great. of the variances and stuff. But um overall the 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 overall um floor floor plan layout. Thank, um, thank you so much, Alex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, can you hear me? Barely. Sorry. Um, I, I just wanted to point out that we do have some members of the Library's Equity, Justice, and Inclusion subcommittee in our audience, and one of them has their hands up, so I didn't know whether this was an appropriate time, but just wanted to put that out there. I, I'm sorry, I just didn't really hear what you said, so... So Austin, what she's saying is, and I'm glad you spoke up, Alex, uh, our children's librarian is in the audience and she has her hand raised. Right. And okay. I'd, I'd love to, if you could allow her to speak. Uh, thank you, Alex. Um, in, in one second, Christine, do you have something else? Yes, I just wanted to confirm and ask Josephine that there's no doors to this bathroom at all. It's sort of like a mini version of like airports where it's all they'll they'll never be doors there's no doors i shouldn't say never <laughs> right <laughs> we're, we're proposing airport style at the moment yes thank you great thanks yeah so sorry austin if you didn't hear me i was just saying there were members of I, our I, uh, yeah. sharon sharon explain i was taking my earbuds out so i couldn't hear yeah. thanks yeah sharon explain thanks so much so yes it would be great mia if you if you if we could bring mia in I just wanted to confirm that with this being on the ground level, these would be the bathrooms that would be open when the rest of library services are open, but also if we had any after library hours events that this um, these bathrooms that are uh, gender inclusive would be available for after hour events, as well as all the times that the library would be open. Josephine? Yes, this restroom is for um, use for after hours as well. And for the after hour events, um, unless there was another single stall added, these would be the only bathrooms that would be provided or on the ground floor. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Thanks for your question. Okay, any other um, comment or question about the proposed plan? Okay, are we ready to sign off on this proposed plan? So um, unless you folks feel differently, I would say let's adopt it by unanimous consent unless there's an objection. All right, hearing no objection, we're adopting this proposed plan as the plan for the gender inclusive restroom on the ground floor. Okay. Thank you, Josephine. Thank you. Next item on the agenda says future design decisions. Who from FAA is going to speak to the future design decisions? I will jump in on that as well. Thank you, Josephine. No problem. Um, so Could somebody take down the bathroom? Um, Yes, I'm actually going to switch that to our schedule. Right. Unless Thank Craig, you did so you, much. You didn't have anything else to share on that, Craig, right? Nope. Thank you. Okay, great. 
Um, so, so this is our um, schedule that we devised for um, strictly for design development. Um, we added the yellow boxes um, not too long ago to, <laughs> to indicate the decision milestones um, that we think are going to be important to hit um, during this process. Um, as you can see, the yellow um, boxes are sort of um, heavy at the front, and um, and it's definitely going to be um, a little bit more hectic at the onset of DD um, in order for us to get some, you know, of these decisions uh, squared away um, at the at the beginning and just moving forward and plugging away um, at DD in in this time frame. So um, a couple of well, like, let me just first back up a bit and let you know that what we'll do on our end is um, create a, a list of questions and um, and items to sort of um, send to, send your way, um, so you can sort of digest and and know um, what we're going to need from you at the very beginning, because you can see some some items here are, are really at the first week of DD, um, and so. Um, some critical items will be the VE items that we'll have to run through and make sure that we're all on board and on the same page. Um, and, and, and some of the other items that are going to trickle through are part of the VE discussion as well, such as exterior materials. So, um, so some of those key points will be um, meeting with you at the, at the very beginning to, to, to touch upon those. And they may be very quick meetings and it might just be, you know, saying, okay, we're, we're good with this. And, you know, items one through 10, we're okay with, we're moving forward with, but we just want to get that final confirmation to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, the landscape was next on the list. We haven't met with um, all of you and our landscape designer um, to run through the plans that were issued for SDs. So, um, so our first kickoff meeting um, will happen early on in the month, in that first month. Um, and so getting some feedback from you um, with, with the landscape designer on board, um, they will, you know, take your feedback and sort of, you know, plug through um, DDs and then we'll meet again um, closer to midway through DDs to sort of get that final approval from you. Um, so uh, the the next VE item um, design review that you see here is sort of just finalizing everything because our, we're imagining on this first meeting here that there might be some things that um, that we need to um, a first confirm and then B if there are any changes to that we would make those design changes and we would be done within the first month of those VE design changes and we would present that to you and whatever that may be if if the um, sawtooth roof is gone then we will we'll make those changes in that first month and show you at by the end of the month what that looks like um, that's just an example um, that I'm throwing out there um, and then one other meeting that will be happening is with our interior designer. Um, they will want to meet. We have one meeting scheduled with them for a DD um, with you folks, and that will have to happen within the first month as well. Um, if you, we sort of drew a big line down down um, the schedule here because that first month is really when we want to lock down any plan changes. Um, this is sort of critical to move us forward into starting to develop details. And so having um, exterior materials squared away, plan layout squared away, we can move forward to the next, um, the next, you know, phase within DD for us internally, which is starting to get details um, drawn. So um, does, any, does anyone have any questions um, regarding the first month? Sean. So I guess I'm just I knew this was discussed at a prior meeting. Um, are we gonna? Are we going to move to meeting every week um, in order to facilitate the schedule? Um, do you anticipate we will have to vote on anything that we see for the first time at a meeting, or will, will we always sort of be able to see something at one meeting and then vote on it at the next meeting? Um, just thinking how we fold sort of the the accelerated or maybe the, the you know the quicker schedule with our current meeting schedule every other week. 
Josephine? I would almost say can, if Craig could speak to that one, because um, okay. I know he's been working on marking up this plan as well, and we didn't get to incorporate all that, Craig, yet. <laughs> oh, no problem, no problem. So, uh, Sean, to your first question, um, the meeting schedule, yes, in this first month, there would be almost weekly uh, meetings. Um, what we're proposing is that, uh, Josephine, if you zoom in a little bit to maybe one of the, Oops. maybe the landscape one. So all this starts, so month one is in reality uh, starts in January. It's not January 1st, it's like January 14th or something like that. And so then each week, each one of these bars represents a week. And so uh, the design team needs, um, actually landscape's not a great example because you will have sort of a, a second opportunity later. But if you're looking at the interiors, so for interiors, we've got one week in which to present and then make a decision on um, which option or options um, the, the committee would like. And so what I would propose is say that week number three is maybe at the end of that even is when the design team would send over, hey, here's what we're gonna present next week. So everyone gets a day or two to kind of thumb through it. Then the beginning of week four, maybe Tuesday, um, we would have the design subcommittee meeting. And at that meeting, the design team, Michael Alexander would come, they would present, walk through, answer questions, get the design uh, subcommittee um, to have, uh, to maybe formulate an opinion or a recommendation. And then later in that same week, we would have our LBC meeting where maybe Feingold Alexander is not present, but uh, the design subcommittee, uh, you know, I can show the presentation again, the design subcommittee can say, this was our recommendation, and then the LBC can make a decision on it. And then the very next morning, I'll send that decision to the design team um, so that they can proceed ahead. So that that's method is what I propose for each one of these yellow bars, uh, pretty much. Um, so yes, um, that's the sort of streamlined decision making uh, I was referring to at the very beginning of the meeting and um, would uh, allow, a, allow the design team to both present the information they uh, have developed and then also receive feedback in a very rapid um, time frame. Can I quickly respond to that, Austin? Please do, Sean. So, um, so that sounds fine. It sounds like if if we do want to, um, if we do want to be able to uh, see something, see the presentation, and ask questions, um, and, and maybe this is just a suggestion. Maybe the design review uh, committees, maybe those are also posted as full committee meetings in case um, other members want to participate. Uh, just because it's going to be an accelerated timeline. Um, and if we don't have enough that we just don't call the full committee meeting. Um, and, it, and I'll just, it seems like this is gonna be a lot of logistical work on your part, Craig, which I think <laughs> working with you, you're up for it. But um, I think it'll be really important to kind of, yeah, make sure that there's that sort of um, phasing where there's a, a review. If we can get a recommendation, that'd be great before a decision is asked for at a, at a full committee meeting. So I just want to uh, just follow up, if I may, Alex, before you come in. Um, I hope at the end of this, we can consider this process that you just described, Sean. Because what I worry about is if we say there's a design subcommittee meeting and there's some chewing going on, and then we the JLBC has to make a decision that will be in the position where some question will come up from a JLBC member at the point at which we need to make a decision. And um, I don't have a view of this, but I, I'm inclined to say that uh, we might be better served exactly by what you described, that we would try in effect to, to schedule JLBC meetings twice a week. And if we can get everybody there, we can get everybody there. But the more people that we get at the beginning of the week, the less likely we are gonna run into the Oh, but you know, I think about this. Um, so I, I do think that today we really need to drill down to exactly the question that you were raising, which is how can we maximize the input of everybody on the committee uh, in advance of the moment when we need to make a decision? Alex? Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd like to add to this, I hope, in a, in a positive way, not in a uh, way that 
<laughs> adds more to the logistics, but um, the library is very fortunate in that we have some subcommittees with experts. So for example, we have our sustainability committee where we have you know, engineers and et cetera that are experts in sustainability. Um, we have an equity, justice and inclusion subcommittee, um, also expertise in the fields. And we have a garden advisory committee also comprised of landscape architects and things. And part of each of their, their, um, uh, their task, their mission statement, I can't think of the word off the top of my head, um, is input on the building project. So I'm wondering if we could uh, invite at the appropriate time those committee members because they are likely to be asking questions that we're not thinking of sure. and taking advantage of the group Sure. Who know the building, who know the project and have the expertise yeah. in those specific. So I don't necessarily want sustainability people there, you know, when we're talking about, yeah, I don't know, you, you, in a way that makes sense where, um, you know, I certainly don't have the expertise in any of these areas. So I appreciate those uh, people who have agreed to serve on those boards if we, or those committees, if we could include them somehow. Yeah, makes a lot, makes a lot of sense. We'll have to figure out a, a way to make sure that we're, these these things are phased in such a way that we can draw on their expertise, um, either by inviting them to a meeting or sending them the things to invent, you know, in review. Sharon. So you know, I never disagree with Austin, but here's my concern about posting two JLBC meetings every week. It's the need for a quorum and. Um, I, lo I love what you're saying. I, do, I It would just mean we have to make sure that we're all there. Otherwise, then the meeting doesn't happen. Right. Well, what we've got to do is we've got to ensure that, uh, I mean, I don't care whether we notice it as a meeting or how we do it, but you heard my concern, right? My concern is that Christine convenes a subcommittee meeting. We do our thing on Tuesday and then on Thursday we have a meeting and a whole new set of concerns come up um, and we've got to make a decision. That's what I think was being raised before about how do we do this in a way that allows the committee to kind of deliberate and you know in a way that allows us at the end of the week to make a decision. Austin, can I follow up? I can't raise my hand. I don't see it. Sure, I'm, absolutely. Um, and maybe I'll look to Paul because because he's more of an expert on this than I. I know in the past, for example, we have we have finance committee meetings and they've scheduled them as as council meetings just in case um, they have counselors, other counselors show up that want to participate. They schedule both. Um, if the other counselors don't show up, they just don't hold that meeting, right. but they still hold the finance committee meeting. I don't quite see why this would be any different where you could do the design uh, subcommittee and the full JLBC if you get the full membership grade. If you don't, um, then you're just doing the design subcommittee portion Great. with 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 other members uh, just listening at that point. Yeah. Paul? I, I agree with that. And um, But I think if we are at a decision point, it should be conveyed to the members of the who are not on the design subcommittee that we really want people there to make a decision. To, so we know when to prioritize. Uh, Christine. So the design subcommittee meetings are usually not um, recorded. And I think part of what we're talking about here is, is building committee members, we don't just want to learn or see things for the first time that day and then have to vote and discuss it. We're trying to like front load it a little bit so we see it we talk about it, some issues get brought up, and then we can kind of chew on it for a couple of days. Um, I don't know, is is that possible where we would could record the designs so that other members who couldn't go or, uh, you know, can can at least see that before we actually have our building committee meeting? I assume they could be recorded, but uh, Paul? Yeah, of course, if, we're, if they're meeting by, by Zoom, you just record it. We should be doing right. that anyway, I think. Uh, I'm uh, myself disposed, um, and I think we should kind of decide this. I'm disposed to follow the procedure that Sean and Paul have talked about, which is a kind of dual notice of meetings. And my hope would be that the more people that can attend and participate and therefore, I hope we would have a quorum of the JLBC 
uh, the better off we're going to we're going to be under this accelerated schedule. Uh, Paul, I agree with that, and I just want to make clear. So this is a six week period of time we're talking about, and what is the start and end of that six weeks? Craig. Oh. Paul, uh, yes. So it, it looks from this, it looks like it's six weeks. Yes. Um, and it would be starting the week of January 16th would be week number one. And then the last week would be week number six would be the week of February 20th, which uh, unfortunately is February vacation week. Um, I don't know if anyone's got plans to go away, but but yeah, so it'll be it'll be basically weekly meetings for those six weeks. Cool. So yeah, so I, I think that's really good, and that's a time good time frame. And then if we could, you know, the sooner we get those on our calendars, the better off we are. All right. So could whoever put up the design development schedule for the moment? Could you take it down? I can. Thank you, because it'd be great to see everybody. So are we comfortable with the, the kind of procedure that Sean and Paul have helped us envision? It does seem to me to be, uh, if we're able to do it over that six weeks, it does seem to me to be the way to achieve what Christine was kind of describing, which is getting people notice, allowing them to participate early in the process to chew and then come back together. Okay, so hearing no objection, that's what we'll that's what we'll try to do. And Craig, you will lay out for. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe Christine has an objection. Christine, no, I, I was just. We have um, a few members who aren't here, and I was wondering if either you or Sharon, someone can communicate this to them. Sure. Um, because it is a big commitment, and people have to plan for it. So as soon, Craig, as you and FAA are able to lay out the dates for us mm -hmm. uh, because we'll need to get it as Paul to get it on everybody's calendar. That would that would be great. Absolutely. And uh, for purposes of planning in, in the past, we've done LBC meetings on Tuesdays as well as Thursdays, sort of like depending on the, the period of time. Are those days of the week in general good for this committee still. All right. Then that, that's what I'll put out there for initial consideration. Great. Thank you so much. Is there anything else under future design decisions scheduling? Craig? Um, no, I think uh, Josephine did a great job covering the concept. Great. And Alex? with your questions, I think we had a good handle on it. Alex? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think the design meetings were usually nine o'clock on Tuesdays. So I that would a 9 a.m. meeting. I don't know if that's. I don't know, four is I just one more consideration if we're looking at a larger group is a 9 a.m. work for everybody or do we need to be looking at the more traditional sort of 430. So just put that out there for the group. OK, I think probably we're going to have to be looking towards the end of the workday because I think people may have work commitments and if we want to maximize attendance, nine o'clock may not be the best time. But again, I leave that to Sharon and Craig to kind of uh, scout out for us. Okay, oh, Christine. Um, just a logistics thing again. And um, so I guess Josephine or Craig, so the six week, thing starts in mid-January. When can we expect to see updated, like the general plans and a little more information? Like, cause what I'm seeing on the six weeks is specific like landscaping and you know, these different things. When are we gonna get like the overall? Cause it's been a while and I'm sure things are changing. Do you um, want me to jump on there, Craig? Or yeah, do you want to yes, go ahead. So what, um, what, when are we gonna see the kind of revised schematics, I guess, is that right? Is that what you're talking about, Christine? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So our plan is to hopefully meet with you guys soon um, before DD starts. So we're tweaking everything now and we're hopefully going to get something on the calendar. Craig and Sharon and, and, and all of us, we were going to um, internally just meet and talk about next steps and when we can get um, a date on the calendar to run through the plans with, with you folks. 
So, and right. so that's before the January 16th. Okay, great. Yeah. The process that you are guys are contemplating also contemplates consultations and approvals with MBLC. Is that correct? That's correct. How is that going to work? In other words, uh, you present something to us. The thing that you present to us will have been previously approved by MBLC, and then we discuss it, and we don't like it, and we want to change it. I mean, how does the uh, work with the MBLC phase in with our approvals? So we um, are in connection with them. We talk to them weekly. Um, so we're not doing a lot of work under without being under under their review. Um, we actually already had one meeting with with Andrea um, and um, we just um, are going to continue feeding plans to them back and forth and and meet whenever they like. Um, we, of course, will um, make sure that locations of program, et cetera, are, are um, we have their, their blessing on it um, before we actually would get you excited um, about a potential um, shift in, in program space or floor plan. And, um, and, and, then, um, and then run it by you guys and right. see, of course, um, with a couple different options, um, that's the plan um, right. and, and move forward that way. Right, that sounds great. Thank you for that. Thank you for all that work with MBLC. Okay, Colliers, are you, um, are we all, we all set with you? Yes. Thank you. And thank you for the amazingly good work that you all have done in helping us face the reality now of uh, the work that we need to do between now and our drop dead deadline. Um, it's really very helpful to have seen all that. And thanks for helping us imagine the way the process is going to work. The next item on the agenda are subcommittee reports. And since the subcommittees have not met, I wonder whether there's anything for the subcommittees to report. Christine? Nothing. Okay. Alex? N nothing to report, but I, I do have a question about, um, and the thing that comes immediately to mind is the gender inclusive bathrooms. Um, and that seems like something that uh, we would be well served by making sure that we're reaching out to, you know, the LGBTQ plus community about, you know, their feedback, um, as well as I think libraries uh, have particular concerns around safety issues um, that may not be germane in other types of buildings. So I guess I would, I don't know if I need, I don't know if we need, I don't know if the committee needs direction from this group, but my inclination would be for the group to, I just want to make sure from a timing perspective with FAA that, um, any 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 public any outreach any outreach we're going to be doing you know we're not in any way slowing down the process so I guess I want to make sure that maybe part of the scheduling with Colliers and with the library director and FAA is when it's appropriate to get public feedback when it's not appropriate and and that we know what the timing is so that we can you know set up expectations with the public whether it's you know we have one meeting this right. is it or right in or you know whatever it looks like right very helpful. So Craig and Sharon, you'll work uh, to, with that in mind as well. Yes. Great. Very helpful. Thank you, Alex. So I know of no correspondence. Um, I know of no topic not anticipated 48 hours in advance. So the next item would be public comment. We have five attendees and grateful for their attention and their attendance. Uh, do, does any member of the public wish to speak? If you do, please raise your virtual hand. Okay, I see none. Um, the next meeting is December 15th at 4.30. That's what it says on the agenda. Is that right? That's when we are next meeting, December 15th at 4.30, Sharon? Yeah, unless Craig, uh, Josephine, unless you all need us sooner than that, or I, I think the timing sounds pretty good, but I defer okay. to Josephine. Josephine, do you need us sooner than the fifteenth of December? Two weeks. Um, that might be a good date, but I think um, when we meet Sharon next week, we'll have a better understanding. But that might be the next. 
that might be an appropriate time to meet. Um, okay. And if you need us sooner than that, you will let us know soon about whether or not you need us sooner than the 15th. Yeah. Okay. We'll do. That is, um, that is great. Um, I do want to say again how great it is to be back together working on this wonderful project. And it really lifts my spirits to see us back together um, really now, you know, kind of getting down to brass tacks about how we're going to move the project fo forward. It's really, really wonderful, wonderful to get, get back to the work. So um, if there's nothing else to be said and no one else who wants to say it, then I'll invoke the Bachelman rule and declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you Thank all. Thank you very much.